Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning into my channel. If this is your first time here, hi, thank you so much for joining us. I am Ijama Kola. I always find it difficult to describe myself, but for the purposes of this video, I have a PhD in sociomedical sciences from Columbia University. I got it last year, which is 2019, summer of 2019. I definitely treated this year as like a gap year for two reasons. One, I had a baby in December of 2019. The other thing is that I was definitely just burnt out. I went into my PhD program immediately after college and had no break in my academic training since I was four years old. So I needed a few months to just like not think about school and not think about research and not thinking about like learning. But now that that gap year is over, I am 99.84% sure with a p-value of like 0.01. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I'm not gonna take a traditional post PhD path. What that looks like, especially for um, a lot of social sciences and humanities people is that I'm not planning on seeking out tenure track faculty position. And I'm going to get into the variety of reasons why I chose not to go down that road. But before I do, I do wanna share a resource that I found super helpful um, I already knew this is like probably wasn't what was for me but I kind of had a little bit of a hard time like distilling okay like so I do have this degree like what the heck am I supposed to do with it if not <laughs> become a professor because I think that's what a lot of PhD programs um, train you to do and guide you to do and though some schools I think seem to be offering career services for alternative academic careers I think there's a lot of work to be done in PhD programs where students don't feel like they are forced to only take the tenure track academic um, path and if they don't then they're some kind of a failure. All that to say that there's this website called imaginephd.com and if you are either in a PhD program or you have a PhD or you're interested in potentially getting a PhD and you're not really sure like what you can do with that degree outside of being a tenured professor that website has a really great career assessment. That was just uh, one quick resource I wanted to throw out before I get into the nitty gritty of why I specifically don't think that I will be pursuing the traditional academic path. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about how I'm planning on using the different skills that I learned from my PhD, and how I'm planning on implementing those moving forward. If you're watching and you're not subscribed for some very strange reason, one, I'm judging you. <laughs> yeah, but go ahead and hit that subscribe button and also make sure you hit the notifications bell. I usually post videos on Saturdays, but who knows? I might surprise you on a Tuesday and you don't wanna miss out on my next video. So the three main reasons why I personally chose not to pursue the traditional path of becoming a professor after receiving my PhD are the expectations of academia, the impact of scholarly work, and the financial incentive. So I'm just gonna break each of those reasons down, starting with the expectations of academic life. So I think one of the things that I realized very early on in my PhD program, and I think I need to take you even back further, which is before I entered a PhD program, I thought I was gonna be a pediatrician. When I realized that medicine was not for me and public health was a way to um, engage with people's health and improve people's health without actually like needing to see patients. Something that appealed to me about the life of a professor was the fact that they seemed to have so much free time. Like it seemed like they, they just taught like a few classes, like maybe did some research, they had summers off. That's what I thought. And so very early on in my PG program, I was like, oh wait, like professors actually do a lot. You know, they teach, they do research, they apply for grants, they mentor doctoral students, they mentor master's students, they sit on search committees for new department chairs, they sit on editorial boards of journals, like they do a lot. <laughs> but you know, aside from the time commitment, what really struck me was how the academy is really not set up for families and for mothers. Um, and there are two reasons behind this. I mean, back in the day, obviously, like most professors and still sadly in some fields, like most faculty members are men. So the tenure track process often looks something like this. You get your PhD, maybe apply for a postdoc, which you do for one or two years at some school. Um, perhaps you accept a position as like a visiting lecturer at some other school for like one or two years. And then you now get a tenure track position at some college where you go work for like five years and then you're up for tenure and then maybe you get tenure, maybe not. And if you don't get tenure, basically that means that you're fired and then you go to another school. So in, I don't know, 10 years after finishing your PhD, you've gone to three or four different schools. And so that's something I noticed with very recent PhDs who entered academia. They seem to bounce from school to school like every two years. And you know, I think that's cool for like a 33 year old guy, but 
for women and I would wish we lived in a world where that was feasible for a woman who wants a family but it's not so for me I like I knew from jump that I was never ever ever going to be willing to accept a position where I would have to move from this city to that city to that city like I didn't want to uproot my life I didn't want to uproot my family's life I also knew that I wanted to have kids like pretty young I wouldn't want to make sacrifices that affected my family for my career that's something I was never interested in regardless of what I did and that's just me personally so that didn't really make sense to me that wasn't really appealing to me I just find academia to be very unwelcoming to working moms like this system of like hopping from school to school until you get tenure does not make sense for people who have children yeah and, and there's there's racial politics and microaggressions in all careers but um, for me as a black woman who studies race and who studies like racial health disparities I would likely be teaching classes that had to do with race and I've just seen in this Facebook group um, of women of color academics and the abuse that black faculty receive at institutions from their peers, from their students, from parents is ridiculous. You know, there's this trope that's often said where uh, you walk into a classroom and people are like, oh, where's the professor? Because they don't believe that you can be a professor, especially if you're a young black woman. And something that's like most frightening, I've seen accounts from black female professors where their students, especially white male students, have been very aggressive, have been very rude, very dismissive, have written very poor evaluations. On top of, you know, the microaggressions that we face in the workplace regularly, then to have some student like try and disrespect you after you've done worked your behind off to get a degree, mm, I just feel like I can opt out and so I just rather not go down that path if I don't have to go down that path. So that's number one. Number two is the impact. So something else I didn't really realize until I was in a PhD program is like how few people actually read academic work. Say I were to publish something in, I don't know, the Journal of Asthma. Maybe a thousand people would read it, but more so like maybe like 300 people who will read an article. So few people like end up reading that work and I think part of it is the Academy's fault. So a lot of articles are published in journals that are behind paywalls that aren't accessible to the public. So if we want to affect policy, if we want to affect change, if we want our work to be translated, how are we going to do that if the public can't actually see that work. And there are people who have come up with different ideas for public scholarship. I think in public health, something that people often do is community-based participatory research, where you are doing research like with the community so that you are like not just like writing about people in a silo, but you're actually working side by side with them to affect change in their community. So that's one aspect. Um, something that one of my advisors did often in terms of public engagement. He served as an expert witness in a ton of um, legal court cases. But all in all, I think that there's a big disconnect and this is why one of the reasons why they call it the ivory tower because it's like this place that we exist in and we are just like locked away and we don't really know what's happening in the real world. But there is definitely a disconnect between scholarship, academic scholarship and like real life and the real world and real problems. And I do think that the traditional academic path oftentimes does not engage with the public. So one reason why this has been like so important to me I think is in my work as a blogger. There was one specific day like really early on in my I think maybe like my third year of graduate school which is also like my third year of like writing on the blog. Um, I don't remember exactly what happened but I had like 5,000 visitors to my website in one day and on the same day I had read this article um, in a journal where some journals will publish like how many times the article had been viewed and the article had been assigned for a class and the article had been viewed by like 2,000 people right so in my mind I was like I wrote some random blog post that 5,000 people just read and this person spent months if not years of working on this research that they got funding to do and only 2,000 people read it and I just kind of felt like well we can't really reach people if we're publishing in journals like really can't reach enough people another thing is like the way that academies writing is like pretty hard to comprehend sometimes um and is not written like for public consumption so how can we expect to yeah and how can we expect to affect change if the average person can't read what we are writing and can't learn from our research. There are journals that are open access. There are scholars who like are news commentators. There are scholars who are who write op-eds often. There are different ways to kind of get 
it out there but for me i kind of feel like i can reach more people if i write like outside of the traditional like publishing system and now the third main reason why i decided that traditional academia wasn't right for me is the incentives so i'm going to read some actual figures so the current minimum postdoc salary at the harvard school of public health is 52704 and now the average tenure track assistant professor salary is around $70,000. Now those are both very livable wages, not knocking that at all, but those are also salaries that you can make straight out of college. So most PhDs take anywhere from four to seven, eight, nine years. And so if you can imagine, even if you go straight from college, which you should not do, and there's a video why you should not do it, but even if you did, even if you come out with your PhD around 30, I just feel like it's disrespectful that you would have spent five years doing in-depth research you are an expert in a field and you are earning the same thing as like a 22 year old college graduate i think universities need to do a much better job of evaluating why faculty are paid so little especially compared to administrators especially compared to sports coaches there are football and basketball coaches who pull seven figures even tenured faculty don't make anywhere near that much so i don't think that scholarship is valued in a purely economic capitalist sense in america and in a lot of other countries as well now that we're in kenya one of the things that i explored was whether i could teach here and that was cute until i looked at the salaries for professors and i was like yet never mind it's really unfortunate that globally we don't really value knowledge we don't value teaching we don't value education enough to compensate the people who teach and this is not just at the professoriate level even our k-12 through teachers are grossly underpaid as a society we don't really value education enough to fairly compensate people who who do it so i've been fortunate enough in my blogging career to earn a salary that was comparable to what i would have been making if i chose to do a postdoc and even surpass that so even if the burden of having to uproot my family every few years to go to a different school um wasn't that big of a deal or even if i got over the fact that the public impact i don't think is as much as it can be sometimes i just still unfortunately like can earn more doing other things than traditional academia so those are the three main reasons that i've chosen not to pursue traditional academia and again like this is all based off of my personality this is based off of um, what i know that i like and i don't like for me i think that between teaching research and service and which are three components of the like job description of professors so i hate writing grants research is kind of like uh writing i like to write but i don't necessarily love academic writing very much prefer casual writing and informal writing and which is also what i do like in my day-to-day -day job so i actually really do like teaching but something that i realized recently is that i've been teaching for 10 years i have been making youtube videos i've been blogging i have been engaging with people on instagram and most of that content is educational. Some of it is inspirational, some of it is just funny, but most of it is educational. So I've been teaching people, I've been teaching thousands of people for years. So I definitely feel like I'm fulfilling like that aspect of the like professor role. And the last one is service and mentorship. So something that I actually really considered and isn't necessarily off the table right now is higher ed administration. I think that it would be cool to be like a dean of diversity and really just guide students of color like through higher education because it is challenging for students of color. Um, but then another way I can do that is by just mentoring. I've been doing like one-on-one -on -one mentoring for some time now. Like often if someone just emails me and is interested in a PhD program or like wants to kind of talk through what an application process looks like, I'm always happy to talk to people. But I decided to actually formalize this. So what I'm doing is creating an online network of black women at various stages of the doctoral process and bringing them together in a like co-mentorship community. I'm actually really excited about it. For me, it's a way to like, continue to cultivate like the next generation of black female scholars who can then enter the academy if that's what they want to do. Um, if they don't want to enter the academy, if they want to do some an all academic career, then I'm also there to guide and help and advise. And so um, the goal is to not just have like me being doing the mentoring, but to have women who already have their PhDs engaging with people who are entering their first year or who people who are just just graduating and really don't know what to do next and just to really form this like really solid community of women helping each other out because 
ain't nobody else helping us <laughs> so if you're interested in that please shoot me an email my email is just going to put it right here below ijama at ijamacola.com i would love to add you to the list so that when the community launches you can know about it the one thing i feel like i'm not exactly hitting is like writing for the public about scholarly issues or really about like what i research so i'm exploring different ways of doing that you know whether that's through op-ed pieces or whether that's through like being a contributor to a health website or like a health column but i personally feel like i've carved out a way for me to like use my passions use my skills use my talents um but also like live the life that i want to live outside of the academy so that's why i chose a non-traditional path after my phd that's kind of what i'm doing now that's how i'm navigating it if there's anyone else who has a doctoral degree and kind of decided to do something else different from it, whether that's going to work in corporate America or consulting or doing higher education administration or something completely different. Maybe you like went back to school to become a nurse and you have a, a doctorate in, I don't know, philosophy or something. I don't know. If that's you, please let me know down below. I would love to know your journey and how to, kind of how you came to it. And I cannot recommend this resource enough, guys. ImaginePhD.com, their career assessment like blew my mind. I feel like I already talked about it on the blog, but like, I, I honestly like can't say it enough because it's so good. So even if you're not yet in a PhD program, but you're just curious like, oh, should I get a PhD if I like know that I'm not necessarily interested in teaching? I think it'll be really helpful in showing you the different things that you can do with a doctoral degree. All right, guys, so I managed to squeeze this video out <laughs> while the kid was napping. I think he woke up during it. So if you heard some baby crying, that was that was my child. If you guys have any other questions about my path, about potential paths you can take with a PhD, um, feel free to leave them down below in the comments. I don't feel like I need to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. But I am not knocking anyone who decides to get a PhD and enters academia. If that's what you want to do, if that's what you like, that's what your passion is, then please go on and do it. We need more people in these spaces. We need people in all sorts of spaces, but we definitely need more people in academic spaces. Fighting the good fight, I just, it just couldn't be me. I just, I can't. I cannot. Right now, who knows? I think maybe at like 50, you know, when I'm done raising kids, I can hop around from school to school. But for me right now, stability and flexibility are like really the most important things to me. And it's tough to find that in traditional academic spaces. So yeah, I have rambled enough guys now. So I'm going to head out. Thanks again for watching and I will check you guys in the next video. Bye.